Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt, a podcast about electric vehicles, renewable energy, autonomous driving, and much, much more. My name is Bodie, and I am your host. And as I sit here recording this, ladies and gentlemen, I am watching our neighborhood cat um, out the window, and she is about to have dinner. There is a very tasty bird that does not know that its life is in serious danger. So... Oh, and now they're on the fence together. Um, I'll keep you posted as this podcast goes. Uh, what happens? But yeah, yeah. This is this bird has a death wish. Let's just put it that way. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's talk about our show, which is a show called Kilowatt. Last episode, I mentioned that I was going to have a drawing for everybody who subscribed to Allison Sheridan's podcast, The No Silicast, and I said I was going to put a link in the show notes. I forgot to put a link in the show notes. One person has entered into the, the contest, despite the fact that I didn't put the link in the show notes, but I probably should have. So uh, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. Subscribe to Allison's podcast. Email me, Bodie, at 918digital.com, B-O-D-I-E, at 918digital.com. And one week from today, I will do the drawing, and whoever wins will get a coffee cup, a kilowatt coffee mug, totally free on me. So uh, I will make sure to put the link in the show notes this week. So please do enter. You have very good uh, chances right now. Like one person's got a 100% chance. And uh, one more thing, and I will talk about this at the end. I'm not going to take too much of your time. But I have a new podcast. It's called Beyond the Post. And I'll tell you more about that at the end of the show. All right, let's move into our EV news. Ford lost $4.7 billion on EVs last year. Um, that's That's pretty insane. To be more specific, when it comes to this article, we're not going to talk about the F-150 Lightning. We're going to talk about the Ford mach -E's. Right now, at the end of March, Ford has more than 18,000 Ford mach -E's in inventory, which is an insane amount of inventory. In February of 2024, they did reduce prices on the Ford mach -E by up to $8,100, and they have sold more of those vehicles. Uh, actually, in February, they saw a 64% year-over-year increase because of the price cuts. I would imagine if this kind of thing continues, Ford's going to lose more than $4.7 billion next year. As always, I'll keep you posted as we learn more. Moving on, let's talk about Canoe. Canoe has signed a sales agreement with a Saudi Arabian paint company, Jazeera Paints is a very large paint company in Saudi Arabia. It actually operates in Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the you know other parts of the Middle East and North Africa. I say all that to just illustrate this is not a small company. Well, Canoe and Jazeera Paints has signed an agreement for Jazeera Paints to purchase 20 Canoe lifestyle delivery vans. I would highly encourage you, if you don't know what these look like, go do a Google search. It's uh, C-A-N-O-O. -O. All right, now that you are searching that while listening to this podcast, Jazeera Paints is going to purchase 20 of these LDVs. The purchase is going to be split across two models, the LDV, Lifestyle Delivery Van, LDV-130, and the LDV-190. Their, their naming conventions at Canoe are awful. <laughs> but uh, if everything goes right, then they could purchase an additional 180 LDVs from Canoe. So I like Canoe. I think Canoe is a very interesting company. Here is the problem with Canoe is they have all of these conditional agreements. They have some agreements with the post office. They have some agreements here in the United States, the U.S. post office. They have some agreements with NASA and then some agreements with some other companies here and there. And they're not big agreements. They're, you know, less than 100 units. It's, it's just Canoe is just having a very, very difficult time getting started. Like these agreements have not turned into anything big. They all have potential, 
But as of right now, uh, Canoe is just kind of floundering. And I don't want to see them go away as a company because, again, what I think they're doing is really interesting. And hopefully this uh, Jazeera paints, hopefully they see value in what Canoe is offering and pick up those additional 180 LDVs which would be great for the company. It'd be great for Canoe. However, that's not enough to keep you in business. That's that's a, a great headline, but they need to start selling more of these vehicles to, to keep them in business. And I'd like them to stay in business. All right. Uh, let's see here. Q1 2024 just ended, and now we're starting to get delivery numbers for electric vehicle companies. So let's start with Rivian. Rivian actually beat Q1 2024 expectations. They produced 13,980 EVs in Q1 2024, and they delivered 13,588 in the same time period. We'll hear more about that on their earnings call, which is actually May 7th. Now let's move on to NEO. NEO delivered 30,053 EVs in Q1 2024. Just in March alone, they sold 6,737 SUVs and 5,129 sedans, which is really good for NEO. However, they're down 3% from Q1 2023. And then moving on to BYD, BYD sold 300,114 EVs in Q1 2024, which is actually up 13% year over year. So BYD is killing it. All right, we still have Tesla's numbers to go over, but I'm going to do that in the Tesla segment. So this concludes our EV news this week. I do just want to let everybody know we have a Patreon and an Acast Plus if you want to subscribe and support the show and get an ad-free experience. The links are in the show notes if you would like to contribute as little as a dollar. You can get rid of those ads. So for $1 a month, no more ads on your podcast feed. All right, let's move on to our Tesla news. Tesla has dropped the beta moniker from full self-driving and replaced it with supervised. So instead of it saying full self-driving and then it gives the version number and then it says beta, it says full self-driving version number and supervised. What does this mean? We have no idea. This is probably just an Elon fever dream, and he thought it was funny. As far as I know, Tesla has not come out and officially announced that FSD is out of beta. It just says supervised. So I would not read too much into that until we get an official word from Tesla. Let's see. Uh, Oh, we have a little bit more FSD news. Evidently, Tesla is working on systems similar to full self-driving supervised for hardware one and hardware two vehicles. This was announced on X by Tesla VP of Public Policy and Business, Business Development, Rohan Patel. So the story is that some people who have older hardware systems like hardware one and hardware two, they were complaining that they were missing out on all of these really cool updates. And on a certain level, uh, that makes sense because they have older hardware and it can't do as much as the newer hardware can. But on another level is some of these people were actually promised that the car was going to drive itself and that has not happened. So this is what Rohan uh, Patel said on Twitter. He said, thanks at S-P-E-E-N-U-H, because I don't know how to say that, um, and others who have posted on X about this. While we normally prioritize our paid FSD customers to the, ex- to the extent possible, there is a group of S slash X customers, around 3% of total FSD eligible vehicles, who have a different hardware which the Tesla AI team is working to validate. We have a rigorous safety validation cycle for every software update, and we are working as hard as possible to ship the latest builds to all customers. We don't want to give false precision on timing until the validation can be completed, but want you to know we are focused on trying to solve this. Many of you have been with us on the FSD journey from the start, and it's super appreciated. So if I'm reading this right, about 3% of folks who have legacy S's and X's would be 
eligible for this update. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm wrong. If you read that differently, email me, Bodie, B-O-D-I-E, at 918digital.com. All right, let's move on. Tesla is known for trying new things when it comes to EV production, and it often falls short of Elon's lofty promises. But in the end, Tesla still ends up implementing some pretty amazing technology when it comes to vehicle assembly. Well, Tesla's looking to do that all over again with the $25,000 EV. The plan, as I understand it, is to assemble different sections of the vehicle simultaneously in different areas of the factory and then bring those sub-assemblies together for final assembly, like Voltron. This is called a unboxed assembly technique. When I read this, this is how I um, thought about it in, in my head because I recently on Easter was putting together Lego with my kids. So think of a Lego project like Ninjago or the friend set or whatever, whatever Lego project that uh, your kids or grandkids have. Think of that right inside the box. You have labeled bags, one, two, three, four or five, depending on how big the project is. And what you do is you read the instructions, you assemble one bag at a time. And when you've when you're done with bag one, you move on to bag two and three and four and so on. And when you've assembled all of the bags, then you can take that uh, sub assemblies and combine them into the final product. So the upside to this technique is it's about half of the production cost of the normal assembly line that we're all used to. It takes up 40% less factory space and will allow Tesla to produce much cheaper vehicles. The downside, as I see it, and I, I feel really strongly that I'm right here, that there's going to be production hell 2.0, at least for a while. I don't know if we'll see Elon sleeping at the factory. I would imagine he would, because that just builds into that myth-making uh, narrative that he likes. But I would imagine that we're going to learn more on April. I think it's 23rd when Tesla has their earnings call. I'm sure some analyst will ask ask them about this specifically. Uh, okay, let's talk about Tesla's delivery numbers now. It was expected by Wall Street that Tesla would deliver around 470,000 EVs in Q1 2024. Then that number was revised down to 431,000 uh, total vehicles delivered. Now, just for some context, in 2023, Q1 2023, Tesla delivered 484,507 EVs in Q1 2023. So that's a pretty big number to beat. We got Tesla's official delivery and production numbers today, and... Tesla fell short of that goal, of that revised goal by Wall Street of 431,000. So let's go over the numbers real quick. When it comes to Model 3s and Model Ys, uh, they produced 412,367 Model 3s and Model Ys. They delivered 369,783. Then Tesla breaks up the next category into other products, which includes the Cybertruck, the Tesla Semi, and the Model X and the Model S. So they produced 20,995 of those vehicles and delivered 17,027 of those vehicles. In total, they produced 433,371 EVs, and they only delivered 386,810 EVs, so they fell short. Tesla says the reason for the decline is the updated Model 3 ramp at the Fremont factory. And then there were also factory shutdowns because of shipping diversions that were caused by the Red Sea crisis. And then you also had the arson attacks at the Berlin factory. What I'm seeing out there in terms of this news is that this is devastating and terrible for Tesla. I have a little bit of a different take on this. Tesla has been growing quarter over quarter for a long time. Eventually, they're going to have a down quarter, and that should be normalized and fine. Uh, Tesla should look at what happened in Q1 2024 and adjust for the rest of the year as to why they didn't sell or deliver as many vehicles as they wanted to. 
but I don't think this is that big of a deal. Now, if we start seeing more and more down quarters, then yeah, that becomes a very big deal. But as of this point, I don't think it's a big deal. And then our final Tesla story here. In March, Tesla crossed the threshold of 6 million vehicles produced. So I just wanted to go through this because this is pretty amazing. So it took them 12 years to produce 1 million vehicles. 15 months after that milestone, they produced their next million vehicles. So 12 years, uh, 1 million vehicles, 15 months after that, produced another million vehicles. 10 months after that milestone, they produced another million vehicles. And then it took them seven months to produce another million vehicles. And then we have two six and a half month intervals for you know a f- total of five million and a total of six million vehicles produced. So all in all, Tesla has produced six million vehicles. The numbers I gave you, and hopefully this wasn't confusing. I feel like I made it all too confusing. Was every time they hit that million thresh- threshold, the next million. So pretty impressive. Twelve years down to six and a half months. Based on today's delivery news um, and production news, it might take them, you know, a, a seven months this year to produce the next million vehicles, but uh, still very impressive. Congratulations to the Tesla team. All right, everybody, that is it for news this week, but that isn't the show. We still have some more content. If you remember back a couple of months ago, we talked to Steve Sheridan about the automatic trunk install that he had Tesla do on his wife Allison's Model 3. Well, we have a little update that I think you're going to find interesting. So let's listen to the update, and then I'll meet you on the other side to discuss it. Hey, Bodie, I have a great story that is guaranteed to be interesting to just about 0.5% of your audience. First of all, it might only be interesting for Tesla owners. And within that, really only Model 3 Tesla owners— If we're going to be perfectly honest here, it's only people with 2019 and 2020 Model 3s. Well, actually, it's only some of those made in 2019 and all of those made in 2020. Okay, now that I've made sure that everyone has moved on to another podcast, here's my story. As you know, my husband Steve likes to hang out on the Tesla Motor Club forums. That's where he found out about the third-party Tesla puddle lights that we sent to you, and you subsequently found out they may cause your windows to shatter. Hey, we still love our puddle lights. One of the things Steve started following was stories about how some Tesla Model 3s that didn't come with powered trunk lifts could be retrofitted to have that capability. While Steve thought it would be a welcome upgrade to my 2020 Model 3, the idea of having this invasive of an upgrade done to my car gave Steve a little bit of pause. He was especially wary as this was only being offered by third parties. Now, this upgrade would involve wire harness modifications, a physical button installation on the trunk, along with the motor to actually drive the trunk. After a torturous waiting period for Steve, I didn't even know he was considering this, Tesla announced that they would do these powered trunk retrofits themselves for some 2019 and 2020 Model 3s. The retrofit is limited to those two years because after 2020, Model 3s already included powered trunks, and before 2019, the wire harness does not support the retrofit. Steve immediately jumped on this and scheduled my car to be the very first Model 3 to get the retrofit at our local Tesla service center. When Steve told me he was doing this, I wasn't really sure it was something I needed, but once he had done it, I loved it. Before the retrofit, I could unlatch my trunk from the display, from the app, and with the button on the trunk itself, but the trunk wouldn't fully open on its own. I had to lift it. With the retrofit, the trunk fully opens when it's unlatched. Also, I could now close the trunk from the display, from the app, and most importantly, from a physical button right on the trunk. It was glorious. I was surprised at how much I liked it. Now, fast forward to this week. I jumped in the car to get our critical morning coffee, and something horrible happened. The climate controls didn't work. While the display showed the temperature going up and down at my command, and it showed the direction of airflow in the little graphic, No actual air was moving in the car. I'm a big fat whiner when it comes to temperature, but the worst possible thing is stagnant air. After a few minutes of frantically pushing the buttons on the display, an alert came up on screen explaining that climate control was disabled and I needed to schedule it for service. I battled the scheduling system in the Tesla app and we took it in. 
While Steve was driving my car to the service center, while I followed in his car, the air conditioning came back on. So that was kind of interesting. Now, Tess explained when we got there that since my car is four years old, the climate system was out of warranty and it would cost $250 just to diagnose it and that cost would not be applied towards any repair. That really kind of chapped my shorts a little bit. But the technician was able to determine that it was a bad firmware update to the car from a couple of days before and that it had self-healed when Steve was driving it. He suggested we take my baby back home and just hope for the best. He did say if this happened again to bring it back in and we didn't need an appointment. And the good news is they didn't charge us the $250. I'm sure you've guessed by now that the climate system failed again. Off we went to the service center. Now here's where my story gets mildly interesting. I had to agree to the $250 diagnostic fee again, but you know, what choice did I really have? Whatever they were going to charge me, even for the repair itself, I was going to have to pay. I'm not going to total a car or give it away just because of its climate control. I figured we were looking at a couple thousand dollars in repair. But we got the best possible news the next day. They found an internal communication that explained the trunk retrofit can actually cause the climate control to fail. This means it's their fault, so I'm not out thousands of dollars. The bad news was at this point, I had to choose between having my beloved moving air and my fancy new trunk control. In a heartbeat, I agreed to let them disable the motorized trunk control until they have a fix. Steve was super sad, but I was so happy about saving all that money. Now here's the final bit that might be interesting. I can still fully open the trunk from the display and the app and the original button on the trunk that used to only unlatch it. Remember that before the retrofit, it would only unlatch. However, now I can't close the trunk from the display or the app. But I can still close the trunk automatically using the button they installed with the retrofit, which is actually the only way I've ever wanted to close it. Now, we have no idea when the fix will come through, and after paying nearly $900 to have that trunk retrofit done, we sure hope it's not too long but I'll suffer through not being able to use the app or display until then. I promise this would only be interesting to a tiny fraction of your audience, and I hope I've delivered. I think this is really interesting for a couple of different reasons. The first is that it kind of illustrates how connected everything is in your car or in Tesla's cars. The issue with the puddle lights was a real bummer because Alice and and Steve bought those for me as a gift, and it was very kind of them to do, and I really liked them. However, the bummer part of it is a little, you know, Tesla birdie whispered in my ear and said, hey, because the window goes down when you open up the door, the puddle lights, the the third-party puddle lights you have installed, may cause that window not to go down. And if the window breaks when you're opening up the door, Tesla won't replace the window. That's on you to replace, and it can be quite expensive. So in this case, the puddle lights were in the circuit, the same circuit as the control to roll down the window. And that brings us to Allison's issue is she had Tesla install or Steve had Tesla install this upgrade. It's all Tesla parts. It was installed by Tesla and there was still an issue. Had Steve gone a little bit cheaper and installed it himself or had, uh, a third party install the the upgrade that could have cost them a significant amount of money. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't put third party add-ons or anything like that on your car. All I'm saying is this is a good example to keep in the back of your head if you do choose to use third party add-ons. And in this case, you know, Steve and Allison used the parts and the labor from Tesla and they still had an issue. And I'm not suggesting not to do stuff like this. I think customizing your car is, you know, a uh, time-honored tradition that we've been doing since we've had cars. Uh, that That is certainly not uh, my recommendation. However, you know, if you do it, there might be problems. All right. I want to thank Allison for being so kind and giving us an update on her car Just a reminder, we are doing that contest if you go out and you subscribe to Allison's podcast. By the way, I haven't talked to Allison about this. She knows nothing about it unless she listened to last week's episode. And I don't think she has because she hasn't said anything to me about it. 
But if you go and you subscribe to Allison's podcast and you send me some sort of proof, and the podcast is called No Silicast, I'll put a link in the show notes, I promise, this week. I will enter you into a drawing, and if you win, I will send you, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, I will send you a kilowatt coffee mug. Okay? So uh, you do that by sending your link or your uh, your proof to Bodie, B-O-D-I-E at 918digital.com. You can also find me on Twitter at 918digital if you just want to chat that way. Um, oh, I have a new podcast and I'm going to put links in the show notes for this new podcast as well. I am doing a podcast. I've mentioned it before on the show with Rob Dunwood. We created a new podcast called Beyond the Post. And it is a podcast for people who want to get started in digital creating, whether that's you want to start a podcast, YouTube page, social media accounts, you want to be a writer, whatever. The, the, the podcast kind of spans the gamut of digital creation. Rob and I have host-only episodes, but we also have interviews with experts in their space. This season, we have Angela Hollowell. We have Sierra, my daughter, my oldest. Uh, we have Sierra and her business partner, Maria. They have a social media agency for um, museums. And we talked to the producer of the Daily Tech News Show, Roger Chang. This is an episodic podcast, so there's seasons. Season one will be 10 episodes long, and I really hope you check it out. Uh, tomorrow's episode will be getting started, and then we're also going to release the Angela Hollowell interview. Angela is a very smart person. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, check it out and give me your thoughts. Let me know what you think. All right, everybody, that is it for me today. I will talk to you on Friday. 